Or how's the sound level? Uh, it should be good. Okay. Great. Can everybody hear me yeah. here? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming. Um, but, not me. The reason the reason we're here, but which most people know, is that we did an event 15 years ago, um, which was the 35th anniversary of the last lunar mission that Apollo did. Paul Ortliff, who is a Portly boy through and through, uh, his parents, who were great artists themselves, came from Philadelphia, moved to New York, and then settled in Fort Lee uh, in 1923. And Paul was the last of seven, born in 26, so he's the real Fort Lee native. And he's also the one who stayed throughout his children's lives to, to raise his children in Fort Lee. And then, and then we, once we were raising the next generation, we left. But um, when Paul was young, he was a, and, and some of the audience know this, he was very much an apprentice to his father and his parents. And so I think it was pretty obvious from a young age that he knew he was going to be an artist for his lifetime. Uh, so he, so he um, uh, applied the waters of, of being an artist and went out to every New York society, was part of everything that was going on, and was an extremely talented guy. And so he, he became part of the landscape and everything. They, one of the associations downtown is a place called the Salma Gundy Club, where almost every great artist that was ever in New York came through there at one point or another, a beautiful brownstone down mm -hmm. on Fifth Avenue, yeah. fantastic. And his father was a member, and he was a member and a working member. You know, he did events and all kinds of things there. Um, but they had a program at the time that was in cooperation with the United States Navy called the NACAL program, which is the Navy Air uh, Cooperation and Liaison Committee, oh, I think. Wow. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, they have, an, they have a program now called COGAP with the Coast Guard. They don't, they don't work with the Navy in the same way anymore. But um, So anyway, Paul had certain very specific kinds of talents. And some of the talents he had, as you can see by the things in the room today, are this ability to be on site and sketch things very quickly. So much with with few strokes of a pen, he could get enough of an image that he would go home and work on big oil paintings when he got back to the studio. And um, so he was a, a natural fit for the program at Salma Gundy. And so they, they tapped him to go on behalf of the Navy, where um, when NASA had Navy flyers that were part of their astronaut corps, he would go out and he ended up going out to the recovery missions for Gemini 5, for Apollo 12. Uh, Gemini 5 is Conrad and Cooper back there in the, in the big bone core thing. The, the Apollo 12 is this composite uh, painting that you see also on the bone core. Those paintings are owned by the United States Navy uh, and they have a huge art collection. Uh, one, of, one of the treats you're going to get today is we're going to have this panel discussion after we watch the remarks by the artist and the astronaut from 15 years ago. And one of the big treats is that we actually have the head curator for the United States Navy Art Collection. It's going to be part of the discussion today. So it's really great. And we're very thrilled about that. Um, and anyway, one of the things we want to do is come. We always knew that the 50th anniversary was coming. We did not know in advance that Artemis One would be splashing down tomorrow. And everybody should watch that at, I think, 1239 tomorrow on probably every news channel. And it's the beginning of us going out to the moon again and beyond. And when you when you hear the astronaut speak, he he said it hurt, so to speak. He knew he knew that he wasn't the last. So anyway, we're going to show you the remarks. And it was a big day for everybody that was here. He had lots of family that came in from all places, and it was it was like a, a feat of love. And we were very grateful to do when he was alive for that. And he died less than a year later. So um, anyway, we're going to show the remarks from that day. And then we're going to have the panel discussion. The panel discussion will be moderated by Paul's granddaughter, Sarah. And we will uh, go from there. So thanks for coming.
When I went in the army, it was nothing going to the army, you know. And I went to Italy and got re inspired to pick up the brush. I've been doing it ever since. Now, uh, I see there is a shot here of on the moon. I must say that reading in the book that Captain Astronaut Dean Cernan came out with, he had a shot in there. I think it was titled uh, John Wayne, My Hero, Ready for Action. So I picked up on that. It's not this, but uh, we're living in an age as, as an artist where you don't have a subject posing for you all the time. We have to have shots, we have to have this, we have to have that. This was a sketch at, at the recovery ceremony aboard the USS Ticonderoga 35 years ago on the 19th of. December, just before Christmas of that year. And that was the end of the Apollo flights. Uh, I'm going to ask the subject of the day to just kind of flip this thing and then we will, you can throw the darts, all right? <laughs> you may want to say a word first before you see what the, my result is. Like this. You want to comment before you see it? Really is a, not just a pleasure, but an honor and a privilege to be here. Now, I wasn't sure what was going to happen today. I've known Paul. I've known Paul for you know forty four decades. Uh, he was one of those those artists that uh, had an opportunity, was chosen, one of those famous artists to try and record uh, history uh, on oil. Watercolors, whatever the whatever the case may be, you know, we brought back uh, even from just Apollo 17, we got over 3,000 photographs, and we've recorded a history of from from the beginning of the space program, certainly through today. And there are some spectacular photographs, but nothing, nothing captures the personal spirit, the uh, the feeling of of the human being. The artist himself by capturing history um, on canvas. And, and Paul, you know, I even just look at this and I kept, I took myself back there in a moment. I was there, you were there with me. I wasn't even sure you were doing that at the time. Of course, all you did was a sketch. Uh, and and what, a, what a tribute this is. I, I told you I wasn't sure what to expect. Paul said, well, you know, we're having this little gathering a little few shows here and there for a while and uh, if you can get up here uh, please do and I thought, well if there's any way of me getting up here for, for one day in a you know in a month this day seemed to be the best for me and perhaps hopefully the best for you because this is what this this is all we got <laughs> but uh but he said i did a painting and uh but it, paul uh you just he was absolutely blowing me away uh I, I, I don't mean to sound arrogant, I'm truly humble, but I've never seen a painting like this of me. I'm not sure there's been any, any other. This is, this is. Uh, 
I, I can guarantee you, uh, my grandkids, my family, my wife, and uh, although my mom and dad aren't here today or even with us today, would have been and will be um, so very, very proud. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much time you got. We had a lot of questions people have asked uh, about the moon, what it's like, what does it look like, what does it feel like. Uh, you know, for centuries and centuries and centuries, uh, we've only been able to look at ourselves here on this planet of ours through the paintings of artists like Paul. I think you're centuries old, Paul. But, uh, yeah. Through the paintings of artists, the words of, uh, uh, of poets, or perhaps even through the minds of, uh, of philosophers. But now, uh, our generation uh, can look back and see ourselves as a, a, as a planet, this universe, as we really are. The only unfortunate thing is that someone like Paul didn't have the chance to stand on a moon and look back at the Earth and sketch it. Uh, because Paul, I have uh, indelibly etched, and I'm not an artist, uh, I'm not a poet, uh, but I have indelibly etched in my mind what it looks like, but like you have captured feelings in your painting. You have captured not just figures, you've captured feelings in your paintings. Indelibly etched in my mind is not just a picture, it's not just what I saw, but it's what I felt when I stood on the surface of the moon. And, and a couple of you I know have said, well, what is that like? Well, I've had a chance to fly three times, go to the moon a couple of times, live on the moon for three days, my own private little Camelot. I don't know how lucky a human being can be and uh, still be here 35 years to talk about it. But when you, when you fly in Earth orbit, and if any of you have got $20 million, go over to Moscow and see if you can get a trip. That could have changed someday. Fly in Earth orbit, it's a spectacular place to be. You fly around this Earth once every 90 minutes. You fly through a sunrise and a sunset every Travis around here. You fly through 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. Magnificently beautiful. Paul and I know you've seen pictures and heard us talk about a fans of blue and golds laying on top of each other. You fly over a, a lake, a city, a coastline, uh, across an ocean. If you're lucky, you might even get a chance, a glimpse of your own hometown. On my first flight, when I, uh, when I did a spacewalk at a time when we didn't know much about what we were doing, that chapter in my book is called Spacewalk from Hell. I walked across the entire North American continent in 15 minutes. Uh, but put that all together, you haven't yet, and I didn't realize it at the time, you haven't really yet seen the Earth. So when you accelerate from 18,000 to 25,000 miles an hour and have a chance a few hours later to look back, if you will, over your shoulder at your home at where you came from, because you can't see yet where you're going. You know, three days later, it's the longest lead shot in the world. You're supposed to miss the move by 60 miles, you hope. Uh, but uh, you get a chance to look back. You realize that, that that horizon that was just slightly curved in Earth's orbit, just slightly curved, it now closes around upon itself. And you're beginning to see something very strange and yet something very, very familiar, like that little that little blue ball over in the corner of that picture. You realize that you're no longer flying over rivers and continents and cities and hometowns, but now you're beginning to glance across their entirety with one glance without even turning your head. You can look from the turquoise blues of the Caribbean across it, but the, 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 the coastlines of North and South America across our, our, our windswept plains and snow-covered mountains and the deep dark blues of the Pacific, and you can do it without even rolling your eye and begin to, I've always said, when we left this earth, we just we go to the moon. There are two different space programs, totally two different, both technologically and philosophically. We not only left physically, but I am here to tell you, having been here twice, that you leave philosophically and even spiritually as well. And when you head out over that three-day period, a couple 
startling things happen. Uh, number one, the earth grows small very, very, very quickly at first until the time comes when you could literally put something up smaller than the palm of your hand and cover up your identity with reality. It's where life is, it's where family is, Paul. It's where your past is, it's where your future is, it's where everything you can relate to and understand, you can block out your identity with reality, literally with nothing bigger than the sound on your, on, on your hand. The other thing that happens that's very startling, although I suppose we should have thought about it, and I said we're no longer traveling around the earth as we head to the moon, but it is dynamic, it is alive, because every 12 hours, you realize that it's rotating on an axis, you can't see it, there's no strings holding it up. Uh, it, 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 it rotates dynamically, mysteriously, majestically, and at 12 hours, every 12 hours, you are looking at the other side of the moon. And those sunrises and sunsets that were happening, that, 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 that you were flying through, daylight and darkness every time around the earth, are now literally happening happening in front of your very eyes. You can watch the sunset on the east coast of the United States knowing it's rising on the east coast of Australia all at that same instant. It's not looking through distance, it's looking through time, through the time in the lives of people. On the east coast here, we're, we're going to bed at night and then and that, at that same moment, someone else is beginning a new day. But those are things that you have to write, rationalize and accept. And the moon or the earth is, is so majestically beautiful. The, the blues of the ocean, the shades of blues of the oceans and the whites of the clouds are what dominate the earth itself from pole to pole and from ocean to ocean. And then when you get to the moon and have a chance to make that first step, and there's a lot of things I could talk about, but I'm not going to keep you all here that long. It truly is. Uh, my first step, having come close on Apollo 10, stepping on the surface of the moon was important. But the thing that hit me most was the fact all of a sudden, after three days in zero gravity, I was stepping on something solid, something I could, which was not Earth. You can climb the highest mountain on this planet of ours or walk the depths of the deepest ocean and you still are on planet Earth. And all of a sudden I found myself somewhere else some other body in this universe. We've chosen to call it the moon fine. That's the thing that came across very, very quickly to me. And one of the first things we did when we got on the surface was plant the American flag as a tribute, as a thank you to the people who made it possible. Because looking back at Apollo, the technology obsolete overshadowed by time, but it's the human endeavor, the spirit of Apollo, the legacy of Apollo. Uh, which I happen to believe is going to going to live long into the future, and I guess when I when I left, I did a lot of things. As I said, we could talk about drove a car, spent three days, uh, went too fast. Would have rather spent another day or two, but we didn't have the oxygen or the water, or electrical power. But one probably the one of the most nostalgic moments other than looking at the earth itself, trying to, trying to capture it all, is when we left. And I started to crawl up the ladder after three days, 75 hours on a moon. And I crawled up the ladder and I looked down there and there was my, my footprint, not my first, but my last. And, and I looked over my shoulder and there was the earth on the, on the top of, of, of those mountains in the southwestern sky of the moon. It's just mag magnificently beautiful. Stayed there the whole time we were on the moon. Uh, an, an earth that, that was surrounded by the blackest black that you can conceive in your moon. The infinity of time and space, the endlessness of it all. But I can tell you it exists and the earth moves through this blackness with, with logic and purpose and beauty beyond your conception because I saw it with my own eyes. And, and so when I, I, I spent those three days looking at the earth, I, I, you know, I said, it's just too beautiful to have happened by accident. And, and please understand, this is not meant to be a religious statement because you can, you can call your God by whatever name you'd like. You can dress him or maybe her in whatever fashion you'd like. You can worship that God, your God in any way you like. 
all I know is I saw, I saw the effects of, uh, of, 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 a, of a creator of our universe. What I saw was just too beautiful to have happened by accident. So when I crawled up that ladder, I looked at that last footprint, I looked at the earth and I said, I'm not coming this way again, unfortunately. You know, when you go to grandma and grandpa's farm, as I did as a kid one summer, you're going to go back next summer. You're going to go back next summer. You're going to go back. I was coming this way again. Somebody would, but I wouldn't. And and I, I, I started to think, you know, in time, I don't know whether it was one minute, 10 minutes, five, I don't know. But I started to think and realize that, you know, maybe... Maybe I've been standing on God's front porch looking back home at the beauty in, 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 of this universe and the small part of his creation. Because, I, you know, science and technology got me to the moon. Put me on his big plateau. The science and technology could no longer explain what both what I was seeing and more important, what I was feeling at, at that time. And that's why I, I, I say that the real legacy, the real spirit of power, is not the technology, but it's the, it's the fact that we sent humans to another planet somewhere in this universe. And so came time to leave. And uh, yes, I am the last man on the moon for now, 20th century, however you want to call it. And I said, and I made a point of saying that because we dedicated our flight in addition to the, to the people who made it possible, to the young people around the world. And I said, we now leave as we once came, and God willing, as we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind. And I. And, and I can't tell you what an overpowering, emotional, and memorable experience. And Paul, if I could create what's in here, the canvas. You and I would be at, at comp compete with each other. You know that? <laughs> but it, it, you know, and, and so we are going back. Just let me say this and finish. We are going to go back to the moon. We're going to go to Mars. And some of us in this room will be here to watch it, and others of us will not. But we will go back. And I know you're going to go, why do I need to go back? I got my computer. I got my cell phone. I got my wash machine. I got my, my high-definition television. We've been to the moon. Why do I need to go back? Why do I need to go on? Well, curiosity and discovery are the essence of human existence. Who am I? Where am I? Where do we come from? How long are we going to be here? What was it like? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Was there life on Mars? Is there life in outer space someplace? I don't know any of the answers. The initially, that was one of the reasons we went to the moon to start with. But I can promise you and I can guarantee you that we will go back. For the last 25 years, we've had a, a great a space station, space shuttle out there. Uh, it doesn't get anybody excited and turning kids on. It doesn't create any dreamers. Another legacy that we can be proud of is a legacy of the Wright brothers, not the commercial airplanes we fly around the world in, but the legacy that they left us to instill in the minds of hearts, kids to dream, to dream the impossible and go out and make it happen, to, uh, to, to, to dream that they can do things they didn't think, to, to dream about being a teacher or a doctor or an artist or, or an astronaut or whatever. And I think that's what we're going to do again. We're going to head in, re redirecting our nation's space program, once again being a spacefaring nation, and looking into the future, is looking into the future of our kids and looking into the future of our country. Let's get them excited about something. Let's give them ownership about something. Let's get their attention. Let's make learning fun. And, and let me tell you, they, they will find their own star to reach for. Uh, I tell them over and over again, nothing in there. If I can go to the moon before mom and dad were born, what can't they do in their life? Tell your teacher to take the word impossible out of your vocabulary. Scratch it out. This library you should go find and go ahead and, and look in every book and take the word impossible out. It doesn't exist. It, it, it truly doesn't exist. Let me just let me just say that I do believe somewhere out there is a young boy and girl with the indomitable will and courage who truly take us back out there where we belong.
not just because it's there, because it's our destiny, because it will happen. And the last message I'll leave the kids is I say, always shoot for the moon. Always shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, I promise you, you'll end somewhere among the stars. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you what a truly honor it is to be here with Paul, his family, and all of you who are his friends and how I'm blown away with this. I, I, I cannot call, uh, this is beyond my, beyond anything I ever thought possible. And I don't, I don't know. Do you congratulate an artist to, to, to paint your picture? I don't know. But, but, but this is truly a special moment in my life. Thank all of you. God bless, Sam. Okay, now we are very happy to have the panel discussion about art and science and the collaboration that brings about white aid and send artists missions like this. It's going to be moderated by Paul's granddaughter, Vera Ortlip Summers, who is a federal law clerk uh, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania for the Honorable Judge Quinones. Um, are we all set up with the. I just need no one mail to come in upstairs here. Okay. Oh, <laughs> no, so that everybody knows. This is a technical part. Camera. This is an omnidirectional mic and picks up everybody. And oh. They, Dale and Nolan, who will be on, you'll, you'll hear about them. They see these guys from this phone camera right here. Right now? So when they look that way, they're looking at the people you see. <laughs> oh, I know what it is. My, it is my prop. You Hello. Hello. Hey, Nolan, I think that's you. Hear us okay? Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear, me. I can hear you. Gail, could you uh, just confirm that uh, your microphone is on? That was very soft on the stream anyway. Yeah, it's very, very soft, Gail. Can you uh, turn up your uh, microphone's volume? My volume is at maximum. Do they have their cameras on? Gail, camera is now on. Can you able to pull that up? All right. And then, uh, Nolan, do you have your camera on? I do. I don't know if they can hear you. Can everyone on Zoom hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you're going to be projected uh, behind us on the screen in just a second. It'll be uh, the three of us. All right, uh, we should be all set now.
Thank you very much. Oh. Oh, I think that you might wait for them there. Yeah, we're we're gonna speak to them through here, even though we're seeing. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I think we're ready to go. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, as my dad introduced me, um, I'm Paul's granddaughter, Sarah, and I'm really happy to be here with um, our great panelists. So I'm just going to give some quick introductions to our three panelists and then get into some questions. Um, so first, Gail Monroe is the head curator for the U.S. Navy Art Collection, which is headquartered at the U.S. Naval Historical Center in Washington, D.C. And for our 2007 Fort Lee shows, which included the unveiling of Paul Orlip's portrait of Captain Gene Cernan, uh, commander of Apollo 17, Gail and the Historical Center lent the town of Fort Lee 10 works of art from the Navy's collection. These included works from the recovery missions of Gemini 5, Apollo 12, Apollo 17, Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Vietnam War. Um, Nolan Fazenga is the transitional pastor of the Highland Presbyterian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. He is also a freelance photographer and data archivist. Nolan has assisted the Ortlip family by photographing and cataloging thousands of pieces of art over more than a decade, including hundreds of paintings and drawings by Paul Ortlip. He has had a lifelong passion for space exploration, particularly for the Apollo program. So he was especially excited to help document Paul's paintings of people and events connected to the US space program. And last but not least, Michelle Ortlip, is the art director of the four generations of four generations art which presents the works and maintains the legacy of paul ortlip and several generations of professional artists in the ortlip family and she's also my mother um michelle most importantly, most importantly and, um, and michelle has been a casting director and producer for film and theater for over 30 years she's the youngest of five daughters of paul ortlip who were all raised in fort lee and Michelle worked with Paul in his later years to secure the future of his vast art collection and legacy. Four Generations Art had a gallery on Martha's Vineyard where I grew up for several years and has mount mounted exhibits in New Jersey, New York, and Florida, which are the locations where Paul spent the bulk of his life and career. Um, so to kick us off with some questions, I wanna say firsthand, I, even if I direct a question to one particular person, just so that this is a conversation, if, if you all want to jump in at any point, if you have want to add another perspective, please feel free to do so. Um, but Gail, why don't we start with you? Because I'm not sure everyone even realizes that the Navy actually has an art collection. So can you tell us a little bit about what the organization does, what the collection consists of, and some of the things that you do with the artwork in the collection? Sorry, I'll, I'll worry less about the picture and more about the the sound. Um, many government agencies have uh, art collections that you don't suspect exist. The Navy's collection has existed. Well, we think of it in two ways: the combat art, which is part of what we're talking about now, um, has existed since World War II um, when it started with military artists in uniform going out with the troops and observing combat and then coming back to studio and what they saw. Um, there, there is also historic art in the Navy. The Navy actually started working with artists back in the 1840s on the exploratory expeditions. We have a little bit of that art, but that is more of a fluke that we have it at all. Um, so we tend to think more of the Navy being concentrating on art starting about World War II. Uh, the actual practice of putting artists in uniform and sending them out with the troops kind of stopped um, for a while after the Korean War. But then it started up with the Salma Gundy Club effort that's already been referenced um, in the late 1950s uh, with George Gray, who was a member of the Salma Gundy Club, who 
was aware of what went on in World War II and was really enthusiastic about it and helped revive the Korean art. I could go on forever, but I'm going to stop there and see if see what direction you want me to go in from here. So I I could hear you. I'm not sure if everyone in the room could hear. I can. Could you all hear her? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I wonder if you could. I I know it might be more difficult, but if you could just get even closer to the mic next time. Uh, okay. Can do. It's a little too close. <laughs> it sounds like maybe your hand was over it, Gail, over the mic. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, I'll I'll ask another question to you just to make sure that the um the audio is working well. Um, so do you have active programs designed to collect or commission artwork, or do you mostly act as a repository for works that are created elsewhere that need a good home? Right now, I have two artists who are civilian employees who work for me. As a matter of fact, about two weeks ago, one of my artists was out with the USS Philippine Sea on some training exercises. Um, Right now, I don't have, I haven't sent them into a combat zone for a while, but that possibility exists where I can send them out to combat zones um, to, to observe things going on. Also, if there were, if, when the space program becomes a little bit more predictable, shall we say, um, that opportunity I hope would also exist of sending artists, you know, back down to Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy um, to do art down there or on the recover. Well, I don't, we're not doing splashdowns anymore, are we? Are we landing on solid ground? That would be a fun one to send an artist to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So how are the artists chosen to participate in these programs um, where art is created for your collection? Uh, well, the art, the two um, civilian artists, basically it's a standard government job. I, I wrote up the position description the way I wanted to see it. And then we advertised it on usajobs.com. And um, though I would have expected to have been flooded by applications, I actually got relatively few. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, and amongst the few, <sighs> I'll be really candid with you. It's really obvious who's got the talent and who's mm -hmm. just putting in for a job. Um, so the selecting artists who you, who you would trust to do some good art and can understand a military environment and be able to function within a military environment without going, being hard to deal with. Um, it's pretty easy to pick them out of a crowd. Hmm. So now I want to jump to you, Michelle, because I know that your father was actually in the army in World War II. So how did he end up getting involved with the Navy program? Hmm. Well, he, good question. He he was in the army as I mean he joined when he was 18, and and he was always an artist. Even then, he would always carry a sketchbook. And I mean I think he when he got back and started practice, you know, doing art for a living, and went to art school. He joined the Sal Magundi Club, which um, Gail, you mentioned, and yep. my father, George Gray, who at Sal Magundi, they became very good friends. So it was Sal, it was um, George Gray was telling my father all about it. And George Gray got him involved because he knew my dad would love it. And he did. And my dad was, could also do those quick art sketches that, um, that it seems like you would need someone to be able to do. Um, so when he was involved with the program, did he try to get specific assignments, or was he just available wherever the Navy wanted him to go? You know that I, I'm guessing, and this is just guessing because I was really little when it was when it was going on. But I'm guessing that George Gray said to, he was always interested. He was interested in the space stuff. I don't know if he was always, but you know when I was a kid, he was. And um, I think when George mentioned this opportunity, my dad said, yay, sign me up. Very yeah, much. I found his original application to the, um, yeah. to, oh, wow. to, well, the, the, the NACAL effort. And um, he had actually put in, you know, around the, that 
right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he went and covered, you know, the ongoing sur surveillance of Cuba afterwards. But as soon as the space program started up, yes, he started sending notes to George Gray and actually uh, at one point was writing back to the combat arts section. There was a young lady who was coordinating the applications and there's a whole stack of letters that he was writing to her to keep in touch and um, sent her a little sample of his work and everything. So he, he was really lobbying the crowd there. Um, yeah, I <laughs> he wanted to go, so yeah. he got to, he got to go do witness the Gemini Five splashdown. Was it Gemini? Yeah, it's Gemini yeah. Five in August of 1965, and then later on he asked to go um, for Apollo 11, but there were no um, there was no room on that trip. I oh. guess there were too many dignitaries that wanted to be there, but they said, "Well, look." Um, Apollo 12 was only a few months later and it was an all Navy operation, at least for the, the crew of the um, spacecraft. And also, it, of course, it was the um, ship picking them up, which I think was the Hornet. Anyway, yeah. so there was room on that trip. So um, yeah, he wanted to go. Yeah. <laughs> So Michelle, you were obviously very young when all of this was happening. Yeah, 65. I was like, this little. No. <laughs> so how how was that experience for you when you were a young kid to watch your father go out on these missions? Um, did you understand what he was doing? Well, did I, you not want him to go? <laughs> no, I mean I I remember him going to Gemini Five, which I was like I don't know how old, how old was I four, four. right I was four. I, I, but I do remember there was so much going on in the world then, and I and my, you know, my older people in my life were were very tuned into these things. But I heard about space a lot from my dad. So yes, when he went, I I was excited about it for him, and I loved the fact that he was going because it was, seemed like a cool thing, and everybody was talking about it. And there was my dad going, and then I got to talk to him on the two way, you know, the radio in the on the Pacific Ocean, which seemed so. You know, live, and that to me seemed like such a miracle. So I thought it was cool. Do you think people um, at school, like your friends and everyone, knew that your dad was going off to meet the astronauts? Yes, because I brought in memorabilia then for you know show and tell and all that stuff. So. <laughs> um, and how important do you think uh, these jobs were for your father in in his career oh. or, or in his personal life? They were very. They, they were important for all of it because he he got to go do what he wanted to do and be with his buddies and meet people like Gene Cernan, you know, and and he then took, with all these sketches like what Cernan was saying in the in the um, in the tape, you know, he he did these quick sketches which he called his notations and then he'd go home and make you know create. He was allowed. I don't know how much oversight he had from you guys, um, Gail, but he just made these creative things that he put together with his, you know, with his sketches and imagination. So yeah, and, that's, and good for his career. Yeah. Oh, go it's, on, Gail. Well, it, we have a rule or an unspoken rule that basically we don't tell the artists what to do. Um, it, at one point it got the program in trouble basically because, well, we won't go into that anti-Vietnam <laughs> war more right. um, art appeared in the collection we still got it mm -hmm. um but but it's this is part of vetting the artists you want somebody who's enthusiastic for the mission that you're trying to do and so if you choose right from up front it's going to turn out all right this, this actually brings me to some other questions that i had um, down because we've been talking about Paul, or at least we've mentioned already that Paul had this really remarkable ability to sketch out these amazing scenes in such a short period of time. Um, do you, so is that something that you look for when hiring the artists or is that a prerequisite of some sort? And how do you, how do you vet the artists? Um, well, like I say, the two, two that I have working for me right now, um, they submitted applications on USA Jobs, but I'll also tell you that if you ever submit a job for an artist, um, 
send along a portfolio. And in this day and age, you, that can be accomplished by just sending a link to a website. Mm -hmm. I was flabbergasted when I hired one of these guys. Um, his was the only application that included anything like a portfolio. He actually sent me a link to a website, which had a lot of his stuff so I could see it. But the other applicants at that time, even though they were working illustrators, did not bother to send me anything, any link to an artwork online, nothing physical, no portfolio. So that, that was kind of a dead easy selection when the artist bothers to send along a sample of their work. Wow. Um so I, I want to go back and ask Nolan, because I know you spent so much time with Paul documenting his work. Mm -hmm. um, did he ever talk to you about his experiences um, on these missions and what did he say about them if he did? Mm. Uh, yes. And thanks for inviting me to be part of this. This is wonderful to see a number of friendly faces and or the people that I've worked with for years now um, trying to document this wonderful art. I. At one point um, in photographing Paul's work, I got to spend several days with him in New Jersey, um, and he had probably a few hundred pieces of art there as things were being readied for moving, I believe, um, and to go to different um, galleries or places that the art was going to live in the long term. But we were able to capture a few hundred pieces of art at a time um, for those few days in the early 2000s. And of course, as soon as I saw any of the sketches related to his um, naval work or the space program, um, I, being a space nerd that I am, I started asking him questions about what this was like and who he had met and um, how was it to be on the recovery ships. And even though this was at the time decades after he had um, created this art, the excitement, almost like little kid excitement was still in his voice as he talked about what it was like to be on the ship and see the splashdown and then see the helicopter bring the capsule and the astronauts back on board the ship. And you can see the human delight in the art too. Um, even that um, portrait of the two astronauts from Gemini 5, uh, there is joy at a successful mission on their faces. And I think some of that is it certainly was in the astronauts it had to be but paul was able as a human to capture that that sheer emotion of what this was like incredible technological achievements but then i think his exuberance about what we were doing um, in going into space shows through in the art and he that's what i got from talking with him about this one other thing to say about that is i also got a sense and i think this captures some of the 1960s zeitgeist as well there was a, a sense of national pride and accomplishment that was part of the, the time and certainly is reflected in the artwork of these astronauts as well that Paul did. There's a joy that, oh my goodness, we could do this. There's 400,000 Americans working together to do it. And somehow Paul captures that in these portraits of a few of them. Wow. Um, so I wanna ask you, Gail, um, on along the same lines, because um, Obviously, nowadays, um, you know, even back then, you could just have photographers go out and document these um, these important events. But uh, the Navy really does care about engaging artists to depict these events. So, why do you think it's important to have an artist perspective when we're thinking about things like space travel, or emergency services, or even war experiences? Oh. This is always such a hard question to answer. Um, basically, the artist can do things with um, manipulating images that that you can't do with a camera, or maybe you know, or you can you can try, but the the result is never quite as good as a as the fluidity of a work of art. Um, but you can compress time. You can you can insert various elements together that don't exist or didn't exist in the same space to, to tell a story. Um, it's just a lot, it's, yeah, it's more creative. I don't know, I'm having a hard time. Am I getting yep. anywhere with my answer here? Sure. <laughs> and Michelle, what do you think that's consistent with what your father thought his role 
in these programs was as an artist? That's a good question. Um, just from talking to him about all, all the things he did, he wanted to, he he was an artist that wanted wanted to do, you know, if, if you wanted him to, to do a portrait, he would wanted to do it with the good like, likeness and all of that. But there's this, there's an element of, of um, I guess, an, a moment of inspiration that artists have, mm -hmm. that my dad had, that I, all artists have, that that brought brings you out of the, when you're initially doing the art, like when he was doing his little sketches, he would sketch what he was feeling, what Cernan was saying, and, and maybe a gesture or an energy that might have been going on that maybe a camera wouldn't catch, you know, or a mood or a tone. So artists can add those things that maybe a photographer can do with their eye and they can some, they catch these great moments, but, and then now with Photoshop and all that, but with the artists, I guess their moment of inspiration is open to, to a lot of different and original mm -hmm. kinds of works and to maybe possibly even capture, you know, the moments of joy or whatever that were going on on the ship or when he, he got to go on the helicopter when they picked the frogmen on a couple of these things and he he really loved that and, and his pictures just show that energy that perhaps a um i'm not sure if photograph would get it although nolan's yours might one of yours <laughs> might. <laughs> yeah but, nolan do you have anything to add as a as a photographer to this discussion sure i I kept thinking as I was pondering being here with you all today, I kept thinking about what what is the reason that we would have artists go and that got me to the bigger question of why do we have humans go into space and in this case venture to another whole world as Gene Cernan did. He says, I lived on the moon for three days. Very few hum humans can say that, a tiny handful. And there is something about that human experience and you heard it in Gene's talk um, that is not completely capturable even by the most sophisticated robotic explorers. If you've seen the, the recent beautiful documentary, Good Night Oppie, about the opportunity and spirit um, Mars robotic explorers, the little um, the rovers, it's wonderful. And you can see the excitement um, in the humans who created and who managed those rovers. But there is something different when you hear Gene Cernan and other astronauts talk about the experience of being that far away, stepping on another world other than the one that we all have come from. And I think the human artistry that Paul um, created to in some way artistically document a few of these moments captures that why it matters that humans are the ones adventuring into space and not only machines. So there's a, a beautiful, um, mysterious element that is completely human to that kind of art that I think is a little different than seeing a robotic picture from Mars, say, or from the moon. Well said. Um, so I want to go back and talk about Paul's history, because um, I, I know there's a lot of Fort Lip family on the call, but to, to those of you who don't know as much about Paul's background, um, Michelle, your father was the son of two prolific and talented painters. Um, can you tell us about your grandparents and how they met and how they might have influenced your father as a child? Well, they um, they were artists, they were students and very gifted artists in their own right that met at the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts in, um, gosh, must have been, I don't know when. <laughs> I, I, my number somewhere in the early, like, 18, late 1800s, I don't know, when did they go? Well, the first thought was from 1900. Yeah, so, okay, so it was the early 1900s, they met, and they fell in love, and they were both very active artists and illustrators at that time, and um, and then they moved from Philadelphia to New York, and then they rented a, a castle in Fort Lee, and then they bought the house up above it, and they raised, they had seven children, so they were always painting, and there was always art going on, so, um, at least three of them, three of their children became professional artists, um, including my dad and I have my two aunts. And um, and I think most of the other cousins, they can paint too. They can, and you can paint. I can paint. I can paint. <laughs> so um, do you think that, or I mean, this is an obvious, it's probably an obvious answer, but how did having artists as parents 
lead to your father's decision to be an artist? Oh, well, mm. yeah, he, well, he always said it wasn't a decision. He was, he was being the youngest and I can really, cause I'm a youngest. Um, he was probably dragged around a lot and had to be with his, with my father the most. My father also raised five children um, solo. So, um, you know, so he was probably with his mother or father at all times, but he, he was literally, you know, really my grandfather's apprentice in many ways. But he said he, he did it all through his life. And by the time he was in his teens, I mean, he, he was doing it. So there's no choice. Do you think he ever considered not being a professional artist? No, he he'd never. Not. Never. That's what, at least that's what he told me. And so he was very much a portrait painter, um, among other skills, um, and he painted hundreds of portraits throughout his career. Mm -hmm. All Did of the Bergen County. And, yeah. Right. So that's, I think that's what he's mostly known for. Mm -hmm. But do you, it, did he consider himself a portrait painter? He considered himself a portrait painter, but he was also a muralist. He's done several mm -hmm. murals in different places. One is hanging in the library. Excuse me. Two are hanging in the firehouses in Fort Lee. And um, he's he's had several. So he he liked doing murals and he liked doing things that were that were historic, where he could do a lot of research on. And um, you know he would love the age of the internet, even though it'd be hard to teach him at this point. <laughs> but he he was a really a, a historian and loved to um, loved to read about. So if he learned about, and that's why he liked portraits too. He like he would sometimes do a portrait of someone that maybe he didn't even know. He'd be like, oh, I want to hang out with the with the peddler, the yeah, the um, cobbler, <laughs> the, 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 the cobbler, and he did a portrait of different characters in town that were not even commissions, and those are sort of the portraits of love because he got to hang out with these people and get to know them. He painted a lot of the fishermen yes. on the Hudson River. He why did. why did he choose to paint the fishermen? He liked the fish they gave him at the end of the day, but <laughs> that was one of the reasons. <laughs> um, he loved the whole, I don't know if many of you know about the whole shad fishing world, and we have a lot of mm -hmm. pork paintings of the shad fishermen on this wall. But in Edgewater, which is sort of the sister town of Fort Lee on the river, there was a whole fishing community during shad fishing season, which is in March, when the shad would be spawning to go upriver. So the fishermen would come at that time. And there were all different characters from all over. Then you'd have the ones that actually lived in these um, these shacks on the Hudson, and there were smoke shacks. And my dad just loved to go. He loved to march. He'd leave the house early with his little, you know, paint box and and his sketchbook. And that's the thing. He did countless sketches, mm -hmm. hanging out with the fishermen. And who knows? Yeah, they might have sang, you know, Yule Tide, not Yule Tide, but yeah. a sea mm -hmm. dance. You know, you know. Um, Nolan, did, did Paul ever talk to you about the people he would paint around Fort Lee? Oh, yes, I don't remember specific uh, conversations, but especially we did talk, there are quite a few paintings of the fishermen. And so he told me the whole scene and what that was like. Um, it sounded like he just looked for interesting lives to document. And, and when he met people, I don't know how often Michelle or Sarah, you could tell me how often he would spontaneously ask somebody if he could paint them, but it sounds like some of it was a, a like a collecting of different diverse human faces and lives. Yes, that, that's what that's what he, he loved. He loved he loved people. Yeah, he's a people person. He loved to get to know people. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, here my questions have gotten out of order at this point. Um, I want to talk about since since we're at the Fort Lee Library and we're in Fort Lee, um, I'm wondering, uh, Michelle, having grown up in Fort Lee and having been, you know, participating in the arts community here, how important do you think the arts are to the Fort Lee community? Well, I think they're very, very important. I mean, I think they're important, obviously, for every for the world in every field you know i think i think that um that a town or a community that doesn't have the arts is not is not um is not fostering the um the best parts of, of us as people and, and what goes on in our souls and hearts and and people love to express themselves in, in some way either and if they don't want to communicate to someone else they can express themselves alone with themselves through music or visual art 
and, and those things kind of bring us together as human beings. So it brings us together as communities, as communities. So I and Portly has always been so very supportive of the arts, hmm. always. And, and even now they're doing initiatives with um, outdoor murals that are happening here. So it's really, it's exciting. It's happening. Um, and sorry, did someone want to jump in? Um, what, do, what do you think the legacy of um, the Paul Ortlip collection and the Ortlip family, um, role, what role do you think Ortley plays in that legacy? Well, they've always been supportive. And here at the library, we're, we're, um, we're displaying and, and working collaboratively to, um, to show pieces of art that would just norm, normally be, ordinarily be in storage. And, um, and that that's one of um, our goals as a family is to bring the is to start showing the art to more people and sharing, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and that's what my goal is. And we've been discussing with the town of Fortley um, to creating an art museum in the town because it's the act, it's a per perfect thing to complement what's going on now anyway, and to um, to sort of fuse the the new with the old because this is a town that's constantly changing. Um, we want to hold on to what what's old, but we also want to move with progress, et cetera. So um, I think the town has been, um, seems to be working very hard to, to make that balance, to create that balance, which is nice, nice to see. Um, great, um, thank you all for being here. I just want to ask a quick and easy final question, but um, what is everyone's hope for the new year, whether it relates to arts in the community, space exploration, whatever. I'll start with you, Michelle. What's you been talking? Um, well, my hope for the future is world peace. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but through that, I think all what we're talking about is important through art and the merging of art and science and how they can co they can exist together and they serve they serve each other. I mean I was I was amazed at that when I watched the um that new, um, not the Hubble, it's the name of the- The James Webb Telescope. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How they had, um, they, were, they were actually discussing, they had, they were showing us artists who were illustrating or touching up some of the colors and, you know, and they had them there in front of their computers doing that. And so they, they uh, art and science has always served each other in the world. And I just hope that that brings us, that unites us all in the next few years instead of, you know what's ha what's happening in different places. Nolan, I am fully on board with everything that Michelle said, and I I think that I am hopeful that things like the Webb Telescope and the Artemis missions might help us as as a planet regain a little bit more of that wonder that people seem to have during the Apollo period as well. Um, we need some kind of creative hope. Um, everybody knows what's broken about the world, but we also live in an astounding neighborhood of space and to be able to see a little bigger than the even just the immediate problems in front of us. I would yearn for that, that we'll get we'll get to take that long view as Cernan talked about looking back at this this beautiful little round world where where we all live. I will hope for more of that sense of wonder for this coming year. Well said. And Gail, what about you? Um, I echo both of them that have gone before, but also um, not only to just, do I not want more, do I want more art? I want everybody, you go do more art, mm. do some good art, do some bad art, go do art. <laughs> Love it. Thanks to all three of you for being here. And I, I'm sure that Paul and Jean would have loved this discussion that we've had. And we're here. <laughs> yeah, wishing everyone a, a great holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, good people. Peace. Oh, I was supposed to show this, I guess. Oh, 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 o
Who are the two? I don't know. Oh, oh.